All right, there we go. Hey, I just want to give you all a little plug also. We'll talk about this more during the divine service time period, but we've got the days of Noah starting in just two weeks, okay? So October 27 is going to be our opening night. It's going to be a Friday evening. And at 6 o'clock, we'll have uh, some food, some light snacks and that type of thing. And then at 6.30, we'll start the show. And so if you've never seen the days of Noah, this is going to be a must-see. This is really cool. What they do in this documentary series is a four-part series, so we'll do it for four nights, um, a Friday, Saturday, and then another Friday and Saturday, um, back-to-back weekends. Uh, the first one, they go over the flood because Jesus talks about at, in the end times, it would be like the days of Noah. All right. So the question begs to be asked, what were the days of Noah like? And was there ever a day of Noah? And so they look into the evidence uh, to back up the flood claim, the flood story, a catastrophic worldwide type of event. And so you get to get hands-on uh, hands type of a, of, a, of, a, of a viewing of these geologists and these archaeologists looking at the record that we see uh, of flood stories, but also of the evidence of the flood itself. And then the next three films, they go over different bio, end-time Bible prophecies. They study it in depth. You're able to see the process of studying uh, the prophecies over the past couple hundred years and what those implications are for us today. Okay, It's very interesting. Um, free, of course. Invite yourself. Invite your friends. And um, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on. So I've got a whole bunch of flyers here. We'll, com we'll pass them out today. Okay? That's exactly right. Um, so let's jump into our lesson study for this week. So I love this series, God's Mission, My Mission, right? Uh, very important when we think about the purpose that God gave to the church. What, what is its vision? What's its reason for existence, okay? And we need to be about our Father's business, right? This is what God has asked us to do. And so let's find out a little bit more of those details. And so this is a lesson two. And so we're right there in the beginning of it. And really, this kind of the, the, the opening day, um, uh, Sabbath afternoon of last week, it paints the picture of the story of redemption, okay? God's eternal plan for us. So let me ask you, was this whole sin thing, was this a surprise to God? What do you think? He knows all. And from the beginning, right? So he wasn't surprised by what happened in the, ad, in the Garden of Eden, right? Um, so what's the difference between God knowing something's going to happen and God causing something to happen? What do you think? Are they synonymous? Is there a difference? Okay, fair point. You know the sun's going to rise tomorrow, but you're not the one causing it, okay? So there is a difference between knowing the future and causing the future. And so when we think about some things that God has put in place, like prophecies, okay, or declarations of some sort of a, a, a catastrophe like the flood, okay? These were things that he, he causes, in some cases, by all means. But there's other things that he talks about that are not something that he wants. It's not something that he desires for us. It's not something that his plan is for it, right? His, not, his number one plan is not for the fall of, of mankind, okay? Um, I've got a friend of mine who, uh, you know, he has, he's spent a lot of time in, uh, in Mormonism, and his view is that God wanted the fall to take place. He wanted mankind to sin. He wanted Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? So he could redeem us, right? Um, and I'm not sure if that's exactly the case, what we see. I don't think God wants that for us at all, because what's the result of sin? Death. Is exactly right. And does it make sense for God to want us to die? No. Yes, ma'am. It's like pushing it's like pushing your child just eat it like ice cream. It's like pushing your child down and they get hurt so you can pick them up and comfort them. That makes no sense. It makes no sense, right? And so um, what we see here in the Bible is we see this grand, if you do like a 30,000 foot view over the top of it, what, it, what we find is the story of redemption, okay? That's what's held up inside of it, okay? Um, we see a, a garden, Eden-like, perfect creation. God giving us a warning, giving our forefathers a warning, 
saying, Do not eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, for in the day that you do it, you shall surely die. Okay? So he tells them that they're going to die if they do this. Warning. Okay? And we know the story. Adam and Eve, uh, they end up eating the tree, uh, the fruit of, a, of the tree. And as a result, sin enters into humankind. Okay? Our lives are not eternal. Uh, we're cut off from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yes, ma'am. Were they explained to the, the, the meaning? I mean, because they knew no death. They knew nothing. So were they explained to them that this is what's going I mean, I know they were told this is what's going to happen, but did they, did they know to what degree, like, they would die, the animals would die, flowers would die, da-da-da-da. Were they, was that explained? But then again, they didn't understand death. Right. So that, that brings up a good point. Um, had there been death prior to this ever in all of the universe? I don't think so. I don't think so either. There had never been death because there had never been sin like this, okay? Obviously, uh, Lucifer's rebellion had already taken place. Uh, there was already this war that had taken place in that sense. Um, and so sin had already it originated in Lucifer's heart by this point, but we hadn't seen the fruit of sin yet. Okay, and the fruit of sin is death. Okay, so they hadn't seen it. No one had seen it. The angels hadn't seen it either. Okay, yes, ma'am. It's why it's um, confusing as to why there are Christians who still believe in evolution, because you had to have had, you know, in other words, before Adam and Eve, then you had to have had death. Had That's exactly right. So there is a, a school of thought called theistic evolution, right? And so theistic evolution teaches that. Um, God started everything, but then he allowed uh, the process of evolution to get us to where we are today. Um, so that way, you know, he, he could have a time to enter into us, right? Um, there, we weren't ready. There was not a literal 6,000 year uh, or, you know, roughly um, um, history of our life on earth, okay? There isn't one, I should say. And um, there wasn't a six-day literal creation. That's the theistic evolution is the point. And, um, but the problem with that is that death ends up becoming a mechanism or a vehicle, a means to an end, right? Rather than a uh, punishment for sin, right? Or a result, a causation of sin, right? Yes, ma'am. Was Satan aware of death? I mean, was he understood the, the meaning of death? You know, did he know that or he just didn't care because he was so jealous? That's a good question, you know, and I don't know if we know the answer to that. Um, in scripture, we're not told, and, um, and, but, you know, you, there's one thing to know from theory, there's another thing to know from experience, okay, and people knew it from theory, right, what that would mean, but they had no concept of what it actually was, death didn't exist really at this point, okay, um, and so because Satan, the author of lies, you know, he's the, the founder of sin, okay, um, He's also the one that brought death into existence, okay? Because sin brings death into existence. And so Adam and Eve, they really didn't know what that was going to mean. You know, it's amazing. When you read in Patriarchs and Prophets, um, the, the Ellen White's account of the, the, their learning, Adam and Eve's learning of what death really is, okay? Going from theory to actually experience, experiencing it. Um, when they saw the, the first, you know, the leaf fall, the first flower die, right? They wept and cried more about that, she says, than we do about one of our loved ones who died today, right? Because the, in, the realization of what they had done and what they had brought forth and given to us, uh, it, it came real in that moment, right? Um, and of course, their sin, God had to cover it up. And do you remember how he did that? Because remember, they were originally clothed with some sort of a, maybe like a a robe of light type of thing, right? They didn't know that they were naked, okay? They, were, they had this innocence about them. Um, but then what happened? They sinned, and then they knew what? The robe of light was gone, right? So they're, they're naked now, okay? And so God wanted to clothe them, but Adam and Eve had, had tried to clothe themselves. What did they use? Fig leaves, right? And uh, fig leaves aren't, aren't going to last. Imagine, you know, right now it's fall, and uh, fall leaves are pretty, but they're not going to last, right? And so Adam and Eve tried to fashion their own clothes, again, a symbol of 
trying to save themselves or cover their, their, their unrighteousness with their own works of righteousness, okay? Um, so they were trying to do it on their own at this point, but God says that's not going to work. That's not going to last. Your works of salvation isn't going to work. Uh, your works of redeeming yourself isn't going to last by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm going to provide to you some clothing. And so he made them tunics that made out of what? Skin. Which meant death. Exactly. So that's one of those things that you do. The scripture doesn't say, well, there was a sacrifice, you know. But the only way to get skins is to first kill something, right? To skin it. And so um, that's where we see, and I believe it was a lamb, okay, because uh, in John, it talks about Jesus being the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, okay? And so I, I mean, the lamb is always the, the, the type, right? Um, the antitype, type, of, uh, this, the type of Christ, it pointing to Jesus, okay? Constantly, constantly through the Old Testament. Um, and so here in the garden, God sacrifices the first uh, lamb and covers Adam and Eve, makes tunics for them, symbolizing what Christ would do on the cross uh, thousands of years later in order to redeem them, okay? It's an amazing story, but this is what the, what the Bible teaches, this grand overarching uh, mission to redeem us, to save us, okay? He gives us a prophecy right there in the garden, says, don't worry, one of your seed, your seed will come and crush the serpent's head. What a beautiful promise, okay? God says, I'm going to put enmity between you, he's talking to Satan, and the woman, okay? And that enmity that comes between us is who? Is what? You ever thought about that? God promises to put enmity between us and Satan. What is enmity? En enmity, right? It's something that, okay, so for example, I want to give you an example of what enmity is, all right? Enmity is, imagine if you were to go to a gun show out here in Idaho, okay? A gun rally or something like that, okay? And uh, typically, what kind of crowd likes to go to the gun rallies out in Idaho? It's a very red state, okay? And then imagine if we had a booth up there. We put up a, a big booth and a big banner, and we said, uh, uh, come get your free uh, uh, COVID boosters uh, supported by the Biden administration, okay? Do you think the, the crowd would, uh, would receive you, or do you think they would be kind of a little hostile maybe? Do you think they would, people would... Uh, be de detested at that site at a gun rally over here, okay? I, I gotta imagine that's what that would be. What they would be experiencing is enmity towards you, okay? If you're the one manning the booth, that ho that it's not that that's not like hostility, but it's like this, it's like this something that de makes you detest it and pushes you away, kind of like a m two magnets trying to push together that are on the opposite or the whatever, the negatives or something like that, and then you can't really get them in there together and, you know, because they're the polar uh, opposites, right? That space in between, that force is the enmity, all right? It's keeping you apart. Um, so what is the enmity that is promised to us? Let's, let's just look at this. This is really neat. Go to Genesis, and I think this is in j chapter 3. This is, this is a neat part, Okay. Um, okay, verse 15 of Genesis 3. It says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. What's the next word? It, or he, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So who or what is the enmity? the context here. Yes, but who? For sure, okay. So let's, let's read this again, okay. Um, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. 
and you shall bruise his heel. Who does the bruising? Who's bruising the head of the serpent? And who is that? It's Christ. Jesus is the one who bruises. He's the, the seed. He's the one who crushes the head of the snake. He's the one who bruises it. He's the promised one, the deliverer, okay? Jesus is the enmity that is given to us. So if you have Christ and you are spending time with him and you are praying and you are having your devotions and you're doing all those things to stay connected to God, guess what's going to happen naturally in your life? You're going to detest those things that Satan is throwing at you. He, just being with Jesus and having him in your life, spending time with him, he naturally brings with him the enmity between you and Christ, between you and Satan. That's why he can say, say that the old has passed away, the new has come. We are a new creation in Christ, okay? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. How does that happen? It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And what does he do? He changes my taste buds. He changes my desires, my affections. He begins to change me from the inward, um, giving me a whole new uh, direction in my life, okay? You notice that? This is such a beautiful thing. This isn't me saying, oh, no, I just got to, okay, I'm a Christian now, so I've got to really just bite my teeth and uh, rid myself, and I'm going to go and fight against the devil, and, 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 and I'm just going to try and subdue all those evil passions in my heart. If we miss the fact and the promise here in Genesis 3, 15, okay? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. If you want to have that natural detestment and abhorrence of what is evil, you've got to have Jesus living inside your heart, okay? Yes, ma'am. It isn't something... That you have to wait and put in some time and hope, right. hope and hang out and wait until it starts kicking in. It can kick in immediately as soon as you give that submission. That's exactly right. As soon as you submit, it's like a wrestling match, all right? You're in there, and this is like the, the, the old style, uh, you know, WWE or whatever it is. And you got the guy waiting on the, on the, on the outside of the rope, and he's waiting to get tagged in, okay? It's that, it's that kind of a wrestling match. You're in there, and you're wrestling against the devil, and he's bigger, and he's stronger, and he's better than you. He will beat you every single time. What do you have to do in order to win? Tap Jesus. Tap your partner in. He comes in, and he fights, and he's able to conquer and beat the devil. But every time I think I can do it on my own, the natural result is I'm going to fail. I can't, I'm not strong enough, okay? So, um... Here we see this beautiful promise, the story of redemption throughout Scripture. It's the overarching theme, um, the narrative that we were in a perfect Edenic state. Sin entered into it. Man fell. And then you see throughout the processes of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the story of redemption playing out. What are some examples of what God has given to us as a, um, a means of that redemption throughout the Bible? What, what are some things that stand out to you? So ultimately, it's dying on the cross, okay? What about before that? What did God give to the children of Israel, for example, in order to deal with sin? The sacrificial system, the temple, okay? Tabernacle, all these various things, okay? And so God gave to them a means of atonement. And that atonement was through the sacrificial system, of, that was a, a type of Christ, you know, going there to the priest, going there, uh, bringing the lamb, confessing your sins, the sins being transferred from the sinner into the innocent animal, the lamb there, and then transferred into the blood of the animal, and then was taken into the sanctuary, okay, and was eventually dealt with on the Day of Atonement. So this was the means of getting forgiveness throughout the Old Testament. Now, everything was hinging on what? On Christ's death. Had Christ not have died, all that stuff in the Old Testament, those people, they would not have been saved. Okay? Everything was hinging and pointing towards and resting in the fulfillment in Christ. Because had Christ not have died, then all those things would have been useless, right? Um, they were all 
uh, showing and expressing faith in that one day, eventually, the Lamb of God would be sacrificed, the ultimate Lamb of God, okay? But this is what we see. And then once we get into Revelation, we see the, uh, the, the fulfillment of this, the final punishment of Satan, the redemption of the saints, the resurrection of the dead, uh, this incredible, incredible uh, finishing story where God now uh, eradicates sin and sinners, the devil and all of his host of angels, and now we get to see the recreation going back into this Edenic state and God dwelling with his people, okay? So this is the overarching theme. Yes, ma'am. Another thing I liked when we're discussing mission and discussing what Christ immediately started doing was the, the demonstration of how he was with his people in the wilderness where he was the cloudy pillar during the day and the warm light at night, but that he really was dwelling with them. He camped there with them. And that's that right. isn't that. The idea of mission is that he came to us and lived with us even with all of the problems that come with being with us. He came and he stayed, and that's what I think so much mission is about, is going and being with somebody and not trying to avoid the unpleasant parts, but really being there. That's mission. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, and that's what God's focus has always been, right? The redemption of us, which is beautiful. It's amazing, which also gives us encouragement. Um, one of the questions that we'll ask when we finally get... Um, in a couple of days, um, is that if God is able to invest that much into us, right, into our redemption, and giving us this grand mission that's part of what his mission is, uh, do we believe that he's going to also help us in the fulfilling of that mission? You know, I think absolutely, right? Because if God is the one that's the orchestrator of it, if this is the thing that he's poured out his own life to do, and then he's asked us to take the torch or the baton essentially and to keep going with it i think that he's able and wanting and willing and desiring and hoping that we'll simply ask him to say god please help us we want to do this i want to talk to my neighbor i want to talk to my friend i want to share my faith with somebody i want to do a, um, an evangelistic series and bring people into the church i want to teach them about the gospel i want to let them know how to be a disciple i think that if those are the things that we are putting at the top of our list as disciples and as Christians and as a church, God is saying, yes, that's exactly what I want to be about. Yes, that is exactly what my heart is, uh, is for. Yes, that is my mission. That is what I want my church to do. And so with that, since y'all are unified, focused on that mission, um, I'm going to pour out my blessings, everything that you're going to need. I'm going to bring people into your church because now you're ready to do the thing that I want you to do. But if we get our focus Shifted on to other things, okay? Uh, last week, right, what was the, uh, the Powerball thing? Remember this? Uh, like one and a half billion dollars, okay? Do you think people were praying? <laughs> okay? Oh, God. You just get, maybe one of y'all were, right? Oh, God, just give me the right numbers. And I, if you do, I promise I will give most of it to, to, to mission or most of it to the church or most of it for this cause or that cause, right? Um, do you think that, by chance, is there any chance that someone out there somewhere prayed a prayer like that? I'm sure, right? Did somebody win it? Did somebody oh, someone did win it, yeah. At, at a liquor store, yeah. One person, yeah. And uh, over there in California. And uh, so lots of people pray enthusiastically with all their heart for things that are not in God's will. Do you think God's going to answer those kind of prayers? No. No. That's not on the agenda. We need to be praying for God's plan, not for our plans to be blessed, but for God's plan so that we can know what his plan is, so that way we can enter into his plan, and so that way we can be his instruments in his plan. Instead, what we end up doing is we say, you know what, God, I got a great idea. I got this perfect plan of what I'm going to do, and we end up becoming, you know, bringing strange fire before the Lord, right? We try to do things in our own capacity, in our own strength, in our own way, um, that are totally outside of what he wants us to be doing. And we have to think about that. Um, you know, when we look at Peter, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was Peter's plan uh, uh, for, for Jesus in Garden of Gethsemane? At the very end, right there. With the sword, right? Peter's like, you know what? They're not going to take my Lord and Savior, right, at all. He didn't know what those means, words really meant at that point, I don't think. He pulls, off, pulls out a sword, 
and he cuts off Malchus's ear. Bam! Cedar, I mean, Cedar Peter is taking things into his own hands. Okay? That was his plan. But what does Jesus say? Does Jesus say, hey, let me, uh, let me bless that, uh, that initiative that you got there, Peter. I, I see your heart's all into it, and you're very uh, passionate about it. As I'm very proud of that. You know what? I'm a, you know, the sword of the Spirit, man. Let's make it happen. Okay? Is that what Jesus does? No. He rebukes him. He says, don't do that. That's not my plan. Okay? I've come here for this purpose. Put your sword back. Relax. Take it easy. Okay? Peter was not a good relaxer or take it, take it easier, I don't think. So as a church, as an individual, we need to be asking, God, what is your plan for me today? What is your plan for my church this year? What is your plan for my ministry? What is your plan, Lord? Because if you ask me to go do something, I'm saying that I'm a willing spirit. Okay, I'm willing to follow you wherever you ask me to go. And so I'm waiting, I'm listening, I'm spending time in your word, I'm spending time in prayer, and I'm longing to know what your plan is for my life. If we did that, God would open up doors left and right in front of us all the time. But what ends up happening is we try to, to get committees together to, to, bre- to think tank what is exactly what the people need, you know? And maybe God has a plan that's totally, totally different. Think about Gideon, right? Uh, you look thinking about Gideon, you think about uh, uh, Jericho with Joshua, right? God's plans are oftentimes very different than what we might think is reasonable, okay? If you're a Gideon, and you're going to go against this mass number, what was it, like 30,000 people or something crazy like that? What was it? What, you remember the numbers? The army that they were going to go and fight against? You remember? I know Gideon's people were 300, whittled down, right? Okay. The, but the other army was like some insane number more, right? I can't remember what the number is off the top of my head. Um, if you were Gideon, would you want to take 300 men, spread out completely around this huge camp, and then start yelling at them with a flashlight? Does that sound like a good plan? No. But God knew exactly what would happen. Okay. What? Oh, I was supposed to pass this back around? Okay. Y'all pass this back around, okay? Um, so this is for any kind of mission offering that you've got or something like that. Um, and so with the flashlight idea, it wouldn't make sense to me. Uh, it didn't, probably didn't make sense to Gideon, but what did they do? They trusted God. This was his plan, okay? Uh, with the Battle of Jericho, what was God's plan? If you were Joshua in the team, the think tank, saying, all right, we need to conquer Jericho, the first city. What are we going to do? I'm going to be, personally, I'm thinking, I'm going to call my buddy Sanders, because in high school, he built a really cool catapult, all right, in the parking lot. And so I'll call him, and we will uh, build catapults, okay? And then we're going to siege them, and so we're going to starve them out for a period of time. Uh, That's what I would be thinking would be the natural course of events, okay? Would that have worked? (laughs) We don't know, okay? But what was God's plan? God's plan was so contrary to human reason, it didn't make any any sense. Which means that Joshua, children of Israel, could get zero glory for anything that they did other than their obedience to God's plan. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, it's interesting that God's plans always seem to involve the humbling of human nature. And mm. giving him the ad- giving him the glory for, it, uh, while still giving um, honor to those who obey him. There's honor in obeying, but right. it's foolish. The things of the world are foolishness with God, and He cho- chooses the foolish things to conquer. So, you know, Peter said, "Far be it from thee, Lord, don't go to Jerusalem if they're going to kill you." But that was exactly what needed to happen. It's the humbling of humanity that allows God to work. That's exactly right. And if we simply pray and ask God for his plan to be revealed to us, he will do that, okay? But we don't need to rush in and think that we just need to muscle it together, okay? Because that didn't work for Jericho. They just had to walk around in obedience quietly. And then 
Seven days into the journey, they did it seven times. That's a big, you know, I don't think they did it on the Sabbath necessarily, but it's a big journey, right? And then they shouted, and the walls came tumbling down, right, as the song sings. And um, it's amazing, though, when you go and study uh, Jericho, archaeologically speaking, when they dug it up, okay, that's what they found. The walls fell out, except for one portion of the wall, which is so cool, because that's where Rahab was, all right? Very neat. Um, but let's go to Sunday, because Sunday's got a lot of other fun things to us, okay? But I definitely want to hit the God's heart, His mission. If we pray according to His will, He will provide to us everything that we need. So we need to make sure that we are sticking to what is important to Him, and He obviously wants people to be saved from the ends of the earth, okay? And, um, and so that's what we need to be about. We need to be about our Father's business. But let's go to Sunday. Sunday is interesting, okay? Uh, the title here is The Triune God, The Origin of Mission. And so this opens up a whole bunch of stuff about the Godhead. Um, I prefer not to use the word Trinity uh, just because it, it paints a different picture, perhaps. Um, but the Godhead, uh, we see that throughout Scripture, okay? And so what is the origin of, of God's mission towards us, all right? So it says the mission of God in Scripture has Jesus at the front and center as the only way to salvation, Christ himself declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's John 14, 6. But Jesus also helps us to understand the centrality of the triune God to his mission. And so he gets, uh, begins to explain the process. Okay, uh, At the baptism of Jesus, what do we see taking place there at the baptism? Whose voice do we hear from heaven? God's from heaven, the Holy Spirit descending, and Jesus in the water. That's right. And so Jesus is there in the water being baptized. God's voice from heaven, the Father, is saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you see the Spirit like, looking kind of like a dove. Um, it wasn't a dove, but it looked like a dove. It had the form of a dove, it says, coming down and landing upon Jesus, okay? You find all three right there in this one scene. And so, likewise, in the lesson study, it tells us that the fa- when Jesus is here on earth, he's telling his disciples, he says, guys, it's advantageous to you, it's to your benefit, that I leave you. So that way I can go to the Father and ask the Father to send you the Comforter. So that way, when, when he comes to you, he will remind you of all these sayings, he will guide you, he'll direct you, he'll do all these different functions, convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he'll help you, um, it'll be, you know, God will then dwell inside you, tabernacle with you, okay? You shall become the, uh, the sanctuary, the, te- the, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit at that point, okay? This is going to be a benefit to you. And so, um, the third paragraph, it says, Therefore God planned um, his outreach to humanity even before he laid the foundations of our planet. And he intentionally injured into humanity's history in order to accomplish this purpose. So this plan has always existed because God has the foreknowledge of what would happen. So Jesus, from all eternity, has known that he is going to be the Redeemer. He wasn't surprised by the fall of man. He wasn't surprised by the rebellion of Lucifer. doesn't mean that he planned it. He orchestrated it by any stretch of the imagination. But he always knew that he was going to be our Redeemer, okay, because he loves us with such a love that it can't be measured. Um, I mean, even his death on the cross, had Jesus been able to give more, he would have to demonstrate his love. That's the beautiful thing about it. He was just capped um, with his, uh, his humanity in that experience. Had he been able to give more of a demonstration, Jesus absolutely would have, but he gave the ultimate demonstration in pouring out his life. So what's the significance of God knowing that this would happen? What's the significance of God knowing that this would happen? What do you think? Of the fall of man, this plan of redemption? Well, he would have come to save just one. He would have come just to save just one. Okay. I want to say something, though, about, you know, a group that's, because I'm talking with several of them, anti-Trinitarian. I have no ability to get you physically into heaven. Why? Because I'm created. Right. So how could Christ 
get everyone into heaven, and it's only through him, only through him, if he was created. And they say, no, he was begotten. Well, what's begotten? Well, it's begotten. Well, what is begotten? Was there ever a time when he didn't exist? Yes, is what they say. Then, therefore, he was created. But however you want to call it, he was created, according to them. Right. Then how is it he can get us into heaven? That's Makes a great no point. Sense. And there's and a complexity with that, right? Pardon? Because there's a complexity with this, uh, with the anti-Trinitarian teaching on the topic, because now it's really child sacrifice. It is. Right? Because the, that cause God isn't sacrificing himself, he's sacrificing his, his son. Yeah. God created his son, his son so that he could, he could die. sacrifice him, right? So it ends up changing the narrative, okay? It changes the picture of, of, of that sacrifice. But when we understand that Jesus really is God manifested in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, okay? The mighty God, the Yahweh from the Old Testament. His name is equated with that of the fathers as well. And it wasn't a name that he was allowed to have because Yahweh means self-existent. Jesus is the self-existing God, just like his father is the self-existing God, just like the spirit is the self-existing God, okay? We see Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf in that context Imagine where he, what he left, what he laid down, what he sacrificed, okay? Literally, what he gave up in order to redeem us. If God was willing to die to purchase your redemption and to, to give us a mission as a church to help carry the everlasting gospel, the good news, to the ends of the earth, do we think that he's willing and able and ready to answer the prayers that align with that, that heartbeat of his? Absolutely. The significance of knowing Christ's true nature, his true sacrifice, then opens up the door to give you and I, as Hebrews chapter 4 says, boldness to approach the throne of grace, to obtain mercy and to find grace to help us in our time of need. We know who Jesus is. We know his heart, we know his passion, we know his desire. His will is to redeem people. His will is to let people see the truth encapsulated in the gospel that is for the preaching for everybody. And in this day and age, we are approaching a time, brothers and sisters, when the door of God's grace is going to shut, just like it did in the days of Noah. We are given an opportunity to be able to go and to let people know how much their Savior loves them, how much God in heaven truly does love them. And I promise you, if God is willing to lay down his own life, imagine what he's going to be able to do to help you and me and as a church to reach those people whom he's already died to save. Yes, ma'am. We as Seventh-day Adventists should not be arguing the nature of Christ because if he did not come in fallen nature, there's no hope for me to overcome sin. But I have an example. He came from the seed of David, from Abraham, and I don't know why his Adventists were arguing about that. Oh, sure. They had the, the classic arguments, right? You see these things, righteousness by faith, the law, the works of that, 1888. And then we see the, the nature of Christ and the complexity that's in that, okay? And uh, that's a very interesting conversation and study. But the, at the end of the day, we have to recognize that Christ has come to give us something that we in ourselves cannot produce. We cannot sew together the fig leaves of our salvation. Hear me? Okay? We cannot build a tower up to heaven. Right? We cannot bring our strange fire to the Lord. That doesn't work. We can't earn our salvation. We can't work for it. We can't uh, receive it as a payment uh, from God. That's not how this works. We have to rely on his merits, on his power, on his atonement, on his sacrifice, on his indwelling spirit. And what is the job for you and me? What do I do? I have to surrender. Okay? Absolute, Absolute surrender. Was it James 4, 7? Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first step of victory over Satan is submission to God. We receive victory in our life and as a church and as an individual as we and only as we stay committed in our submission to God. To say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And that submission doesn't mean that we sit on the couch and let him take care of everything. No. The submission to him is saying, 
I'm going to yoke up to Christ. His yoke is easy and his burden is light, but I'm going to be yoked to him. I'm going to cooperate in the work that he's leading me into, okay? Don't, don't pretend that we have nothing in the work of salvation in our life, okay? You've got to cooperate with him. And that means sometimes you have to say, you know what? I'm just going to have to tell myself no. And Jesus give me the strength to, to see this through because now I've got to say no to myself. And even though I want to do this thing, God, help me. The, the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. Give me the strength, Jesus. Yeah, that's exactly what I think all of us want to avoid is what we need to do, which is self-denial. And it is so difficult to us because we're so inclined to have that be our driving force in everything is what self wants. And to submit to Christ means to learn how to practice self-denial and over time find joy in that. It isn't something that that doesn't happen usually immediately. That's something that involves you doing it and seeing the results of self-denial and, and having seen how God's way is so much better than your own way. That's right. Another thing, too, is uh, it's, I don't need that. It's for, the, it's for the audio, the uh, oh. live stream people. Another thing, too, you've got to, if you want to find God, you've got to seek him with all your heart. You can't just go and say, oh, Lord, please help me uh, win somebody over to you. You've got to be bound and held by Jesus. You've got to really be determined to do it. You can't just do it halfway. No. Yep. Because the, the devil owns the fence, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. That's a very uncomfortable ride. You okay. You seek him with all your heart. Or else all your heart. Work. Right? And, uh, and that's the promise in Jeremiah 29. If we seek him with all of our heart, all of soul, everything, if we just pour ourselves out, we'll find him. Okay? Um, but that's the beauty of this, is that it's not me doing it in my own strength. I cooperate with the strength that I'm able to bring. You know, it's like my little kids, right? I've got three little kids. And uh, sometimes, you know, Cedar will be, we'll go on a backpacking trip, you know, and we'll get up there and up those switchbacks, you know, I'm, I've got my hand underneath his backpack. And there's nothing really in his backpack other than like some snacks and maybe his pillow or something like that, right? Uh, his teddy bear or something. And I put my hand underneath the backpack to, to lift that weight off of his shoulders, okay? He's still carrying the backpack, okay? He's definitely still using his legs. But I'm right there with him, helping to alleviate all of that, okay? I'm doing some of the, the heavy lifting in that sense. He's cooperating with it. I'm helping him up the hill, right? There's cases like that where God steps in and gives me a little boost. And there's other times, like the poem of the, uh, the footprints in the sand, you know this one, right? Where the, uh, the guy's looking back, and he said, man, life was so hard, and this journey was so difficult, and all this sort of stuff. And I look back behind me, and, you know, there was a time when we were walking side by side, and then all of a sudden, there's only one pair of footprints in the sand, God, how could you leave me? And God's like, oh, child, when you saw one pair of footprints in the sand, it was then that I was carrying you. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful image, right? The thing is, as Christians, our victory comes through the merits of Christ, cooperating with Christ, allowing Christ to do in us that which we can't do in ourselves. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, Okay. I have all the, the right and all, I have all the power to keep the pen in my hand. That's the problem, right? That's why we're told to, be, to submit ourselves as a living sacrifice, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, okay? The problem with a living sacrifice is they like to crawl off the altar, okay? And I don't know about you, but sometimes staying in that submitted state is challenging. It's a difficult thing, especially if it's like, man, I know I'm not supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and so I'm just going to do X, not do X, Y, and Z. Okay, our focus ends up becoming on modifying the behavior, but what is in Genesis the enmity? Remember, who is the enmity that is promised to us? It's Christ. For those who just joined, uh, Genesis three fifteen. This is the the promise, um, like the, the the promise of redemption that we find in Genesis. And I will put God speaking. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He's talking to the serpent. He shall bruise your head. The enmity will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And that's referring to Christ. If you are totally lost sight of self, and you're spending time listening to what God wants to say to you in your life, and then in your prayer time every day, you're pouring out your life to him. You're pouring out your heart. You're talking to God, okay? And then you're going and you're talking to one of your neighbors or your friends or your, your family members and saying, you know what I found today? 
You know what I heard today when I was talking to God? You know what burden he released out of me during this hour of prayer that I just had? You know, um, such a freeing thing. It changes us, okay? And it's not changing because I'm trying to change myself, you know, being conscious in all these little things. Because um, you can do that for sure um, for, a, for a while, okay? True victory, though, comes from being lost sight of self because you're so focused on that sweet time with Jesus. You're spending time with your friend, your Savior, you're talking to your friend, you're listening, and he is doing a change inside of you that becomes so natural. Um, if we can get somebody real quick, Barb, maybe, um, to grab a, a pole. I need like some sort of a, or this walking cane over here. Don't turn the camera, it's okay, I'll come back. Okay, um, I'm going to borrow this from you real quick. All right? So, this is a, a wonderful example. Okay, so one finger, all right, one finger. Where should I look at if I'm going to try and balance this on my hand? The top, right? But I'm not going to do that because, you know what, I'm good enough, right? So I'm going to look at my own finger, and I'm going to try and make it happen, okay? Wow, I had it for a little bit. Man, I was about to get scared. My illustration wasn't going to work. I'm going to try it again. Okay, I'm going to try a little bit harder, okay? So I'm looking at my finger. Ah, I'm doing pretty good. Okay, fell. Third time is a charm, right? Okay, okay, all right, I'm doing, I'm doing better this time, got a hang of this, okay, I became a vegan, I'm oh, just kidding, uh, uh, you see the idea, like, I'm trying really hard by, by understanding what it feels like, but I'm only looking at my finger, now, this isn't a gimmick, I let you try it afterwards too, I'm gonna keep my eyes at the top, that's, let's pretend, this right here is Jesus, Spending my relationship with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, prayer time, Bible study time, talking to other people about him, that type of thing, okay? Spending time with him. I'm going to keep my eyes on him, okay? I'm not even thinking about it because my hand now moves exactly where it needs to because I've got my eyes fixed in the right place, all right? I can do this all day long because now everything that my hand does, even though it's, it's doing something, it's all natural because now I've got my focus in the right place. But as soon as I take my hand down over here, oh, wait a minute, I just came back from the revival. Oh, no, I'm in, it's all, no, it's up to me again, okay? Right? So as soon as I start focusing on myself again, life gets out of whack. My spiritual life becomes unbalanced, okay? You want to have complete victory in your life. The enmity, the hatred, right, that detestment of what's evil and what's wrong, okay, that we want to have as Christians, Okay? that we need to have as Christians against the devil and his temptations in our life and that sinful nature that we have, okay? those bad inclinations. You want to have that enmity? Spend time with Jesus every day throughout the day. Think of him. Talk of him. Listen to music that reminds you of him. Shut out the bad news and bad books and bad movies, things that you know are going to direct your eyes to yourself, okay? Don't look at your bank account too much, okay? Don't look at the stock market too much, okay? That's why all those people were jumping out of the buildings in, uh, in 1929, okay? Because when the stock market crashed, that's where they were focused. They weren't looking at Jesus. They were looking at themselves, and life was hopeless at that point, okay? But if I look to Christ, now all of a sudden it's, it is well with my soul. I can, I can go through whatever I need to, and I'll go wherever I need to go as long as he leads me, okay? And so, but the thing is, it's just so natural. You can try this to see if it's a gimmick. It's not a gimmick, okay? So, um, we're going to need to close here. But remember, let's turn in your Bibles uh, to a, just a couple of verses, okay? Um, someone turn to Philippians chapter 4. And they'll need another person to turn to Romans chapter 8. So, who would take Philippians chapter 4? Don't be shy, Bible students. Who's going to turn to Philippians chapter 4? I don't have it yet. Okay. Do you have it? Yeah. Does someone else have it? Flip, I've got Philippians and Romans. Which one do you want? I'll Philippians. do Philippians first. Okay, okay, for what? Read verse 6 and 7, and then verse 19. Be, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then verse 19. Verse 19, that's right. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's right. All your needs. Everything that you had a need for, he is able to supply it. Spend time, though, talking to him. Let your requests known to him. Sometimes you know the feeling when you don't want to pray. You got too much to do that day, right? And you got all these things that are going on, and so you're like, ah, oh, oh, the time to pray. Oh, you just, if I just need a, ah, you don't know, Lord, what's on my list today. You know what Martin Luther would say? Okay? Uh, I don't know what he said, actually. Uh, but the context was kind of like this, right? I, I don't know the quote, right? I wish that I always set myself up like that by accident. Um, study and prayer, the better half of these two things, the better time spent is the time in prayer, okay? Because now I'm pouring out myself to God, talking to him. And then I'm, when I read, I'm listening to him, all right? Don't neglect that time in prayer. It's a beautiful thing. And then Romans 8, 32. Romans 8, 32. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's exactly right. Okay? God is committed to the plan of salvation. Spend time with him. This world is fading fast. Okay? Spend time with Jesus. And God will supply everything that you really need. Maybe not everything that you want, okay? But everything that you need. And remember, keep your eyes fixed upon him. Draw close to him. He'll produce the works of righteousness in your life. Rest in him, not in yourself, okay? Don't look to yourself to fix all your problems in life, but cooperate with him. He will direct your hand. He will direct your steps. He will tell you exactly what to do. It'll become natural to you, all right? That's righteousness by faith. It's by cooperating with the Lord and in his work. I'm still doing all the things, but now it's from a natural source because I got my focus on the right thing, okay? And it actually works then. But when I'm just doing it all in my own strength, well, I get tired, I get busy, I, I, I fail, all these various things, okay? So let's pray, and then we'll take a bathroom break, and we'll start here in about seven minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the promise of your salvation. So, pro so much so, Jesus, that you came to die on our behalf. And we thank you so much for the promise of sending the Holy Spirit to be inside of us, to guide us, to direct us, to lead us, that Jesus, you and your Father will come and make your home within us, and that now our bodies will be the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God in our life. And so we ask, God, that you would continue to keep our eyes fixed on you. And Jesus, regardless of the storm, regardless of the waves crashing around us, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, that we may be able to take each step of faith, doing the impossible just as Peter did that night there on the storm. Be with us now, and we pray this in your name, dear Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you all for participating.